In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Wish all of you all the graces and joys and blessings of this, this octave day of the ascension of our Lord into heaven. Eight days ago was the great feast. Today is the octave. And um, many people are listening now, and I hope it spreads far and wide to the speech given by Harrison Butker, who's the kicker for the Kansas City Chiefs, and a very good football player. He is traditional Catholic, and he gave a very powerful speech to the St. Benedict College, in, I think it's in Kansas. You can hear it, it's very short, very powerful, and uh, the liberals are just gonna go crazy, and they already are, some are already requesting him to be taken off, kicked off the Chiefs team. If he does, it's a badge of honor. And it's a direct attack against a Catholic man saying Catholic things. He gets on uh, President Biden, of course, for his cowardice against abortion. He even gets on the bishops. And not just the novice Ordo bishops. His, his scathing, pointing the finger chiding the bishops in a charitable way applies also to our own traditional bishops. The four consecrated by Archbishop Lefebvre who have grown quite liberal and silent. And then the six or seven consecrated by Bishop Williamson who, uh, anybody hear what they say? Yes, Father, we hear crickets. Chirp, chirp, chirp. That's about all we hear from these uh, bishops. Maybe a few little sermons on Saint so-and-so and the holiness of whatever sacrament, which is all important as well. But why the horrible silence that it takes a football player, a kicker, to, to, to kick these bishops in the rear end, which is what they need. But you hear more and more of these laymen raising their voice, where's our bishops? Why are they so silent? And not just the cowardly Navasoro bishops, we can expect that from them because of their bad formation and their modernist formation. And many of them are just twisted in their head with bad doctrine. Are they guilty or not? God knows. But they're doing much harm to the sheep. And Archbishop Lefebvre, how often he said, the greatest danger to our faithful is to put ourselves under these modernist bishops. Now everybody knows, and I hear it across the board in Canada, in the U.S., and in England. Anyone in the Society of St. Pius X who wants to get married now, they're told by the priest, well, this has to be approved by the bishop. This has to have the bishop's approval. It has to be submitted to the bishop, these local modernist bishops. So that's what Bishop Follet wanted, but it's not what Archbishop Lefebvre wanted. Not until Rome comes back to tradition. So here it takes a football player, a kicker of all things, to kick these... <laughs> these bishops, Michael Matt, who has actually been given very good talks in the past few years, and I do recommend listening to them, especially on the political points. He's better than Fox News, CBS, NBC. He's better than all of them because it's from a traditional Catholic perspective, more or less, and common sense. And he's, his last talk was also given a kick to these bishops, respectfully, respectfully. But we're at the point where, if you've ever read the book Shadow of, Under the Shadow of His Wings, there was this, it's written by this priest who unfortunately in his later years went with the Navasoto, but he was during World War II, he was uh, a good seminarian and he was ordained a deacon and he had an explicit letter of permission from Pope Pius XII to as a deacon to give communion to the dying soldiers on the field. So it was during one of the battles and he was in the battles. He was uh, with Germany and it's a beautiful long story. And my point is he comes to this church in Italy. The soldiers are devastated and they're dying and they're sick and they need confession. They need Holy Communion. The, pre the, the deacon goes to the priest, can you come and take care of the dying? Well, no, I've got things to do. I've got this and that. So he said, all right, can I take 
the host. I have, here's my document. I have it right from Pius XII. I have permission to give communion to these dying. Will you let me at least take communion from your tabernacle to bring it to the dying soldiers? Well, I can't do that because, excuse, excuse, excuse. So we're at this point right now. What does this deacon do? He pulls out his pistol from his side, points it to his head, and says, Give me the host now, Father. Give them to me now. These men are dying. Oh, okay, I'll do that, I'll do that. He opens the tabernacle, lets the deacon take the hosts, and he, he goes on taking care of the, the wounded. So that's where we're at with these bishops. It's a shame. It's truly a shame. And one of them recently told me, well, I don't want to say anything. I don't want to visit your chapels because if I do, I'll be scrutinized with more and more questions. Where do you stand on Bishop Williamson's errors? Where do you stand with Bishop Fillet? Where do you stand with not Vatican II and the new mass? The bottom line is we shouldn't have to scrutinize our bishops. They should be able to tell us off their pulpits where they stand because they're princes of the church. They're commanded by Christ the King to preach the Catholic faith to the whole world and not to keep the light under a bushel and not to... They, they, not let the salt lose its savor. But what has become of these bishops? What has become of them? Step back, you older folks, before the horrible age of internet and cell phones and wild video games that can last now months. Kids are dying now from video game-itis. But that's another story. So, um, <clears throat> go back to the age before internet, back to the 90s, in the 80s. Archbishop Lefebvre never was on internet, because it wasn't around. Yet, everyone in the world knew exactly where he stood. And he wrote letters, and he gave sermons, they were recorded, they were audio recorded, on cassette tapes and VHS, remember those? And everyone in, in the world knew where this prelate stood. Even in Kentucky, Mrs. F Betty Pfeiffer, a house mother and a homemaker, a, a, a busy mother with children and, and taking care of two great old priests on their farm. They knew about Archbishop Lefebvre in the middle of nowhere. So how is it now in the age of communication, we don't hear any of these bishops anymore? And they're all silent on the key issues. New Mass, Vatican II, New Code of Canon Law, which does affect you whether we go to heaven or hell. If you accept these heresies and errors, you're going to go to hell because they make you lose the faith. And without the faith, we can't save our soul. That's how important and crucial this is. And how criminal is this silence? Criminal. So we're at the point where even the faithful have to hold a rifle, a gun to these bishops' heads. Please preach the Catholic faith. Please condemn the heresies of our time, like Archbishop Lefebvre. And we still get silence. And they're going to answer for it. And they hate my guts. They can't stand me because I'm always preaching about this. But we need bishops too. We priests need to hear our bishops also. We used to hear the powerful trumpet of Bishop Williamson in his good days. In the 90s, when he was in Winona, he wrote excellent letters. And he sure irritated a lot of ladies with his letters on put, go back to dresses, stop running around in blue jeans and pants. He got a lot of hate mail for that. But he did a great good for the United States and Canada because still today, good mothers and traditional Catholic mothers are still wearing dresses thanks to him. And he was just doing his duty, as a bishop should. Like Cardinal Siri in 1964 wrote to his diocese in Italy, women, don't go with these fashions. Wear the dresses. Don't wear masculine clothing. And he goes into the psychological poison behind wearing pants. It's feminist, and a woman in pants is using contraception 98% chance, most likely, because it fits the, the feminist mentality. The career woman. 
And that was another great point from the, of the football player. He, has, he praised his wife because she's a homemaker. And he spoke to the girls in the crowd and said, the best thing you can be more than getting high degrees and PhDs and PhSs and baccalaureates and master degrees and becoming career women is to be a homemaker and let God do the counting of the children. He makes all these points in this short speech. And it's very Catholic. It's a good, solid speech. And he's kicking all these bishops in the rear end and the feminists too and Biden in a good way. I wouldn't be surprised if the liberals have some revenge on him. They probably will, but it'll be to his crown and his glory and in heaven and to his honor for defending the faith and the truth on earth. So let's just hope the bishops will listen to him. If it takes a kicker to get them talking and preaching and condemning the heresies, good. And we might have to send Harrison Bucker to all these We'll send him first to uh, Virginia with Bishop Fillet. He'll kick him in the rear and then send him to Broadstairs to kick Bishop Williamson in the rear and then go visit all his bishops who are all silent also, Bishop Zendaios and the whole crew, pick up, kick them all in the rear. Then he's, after he's done kicking all their rears, we'll send him back to Bishop Galaretta, Bishop Tissier, and... Uh, kick them in the rear so they can start preaching the way Archbishop Lefebvre did. <clears throat> now they're ever since, ever since 2012, they've toned way down. And then after we straighten out the traditional bishops, then we send them to Rome and he can kick Pope Francis <laughs> in the rear. Now I might sound a little disrespectful, but there was in history a Spanish general who marched to Rome when the, the Pope was favoring France under King, no, in Austria. But it was also uh, the French were making deals with the Muslims and betraying Christendom. And the Pope was favoring this. And the Pope was weak. And he, at least he wasn't doctrinally weak, but he was weak. And if anyone knows these details, I'm, I'll be happy to get names and dates. But I was told this in Spain, and that, that this general went to Spain, took the Pope with his soldiers, stripped him to his waist, drove him through the streets of Rome, flogging him in his back to say, I am, to him, said publicly, I'm sorry for what I did to the church. I'm sorry for betraying the church by working with a traitor in France. So that's the kind of, that's where we're at now. That's where we're at holding the pistol to their head because souls are at stake. And right now it's either Christ or Satan. And the, 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 the time to turn around is, is getting very slim. And the West is falling fast into corruption and is deserving of a terrible punishment. Were those lights last week, those rays of the sun and aurora borealis seen all over the U.S., are they maybe what Our Lady sent in 1938 all over Europe when she said, when you see the northern lights, know that God will punish this world. In a few months, Hitler was on the march. Is this what we're going to see soon? I don't know. But we certainly deserve it as a nation. And so... Anyway, so pray for Harrison Butker, pray for him, pray for Leopold Chenal, who's also a traditional Catholic. He's actually a fighter with the resistance. Uh, he's number 54. He's the big bear that tackles all those Protestants on the field. And he's a good, a good soul, a good man and a good fighter. We'll hear him yet. I'm sure he'll be invited to give some speeches and uh, Leopold will also lay it on the line. But here, here, this is what we've come to. Football players, uh, newspaper editors like Michael Matt, and many of these laymen now have to speak up when the bishops are silent. It should be the bishop speaking. It should be them speaking, and the priests, of course. So, part two of the sermon, which is where I really wanted to spend more time on, but I'll make it short. Today is also the feast of one, St. Simon Stock, 
who received the brown scapular. But it's also the feast of St. John Nepomuk. Nepomuk is a city in Bohemia. And St. John Nepomuk grew up as a, <clears throat> a devout boy. He, he did well in his education. And in those days, education was good and formed the young very well. By the time he's 16 and 18, he already had ground in philosophy and theology. He was ready to go on to his studies, and he wanted to be a priest. And he became a very good priest. And he preached to up to 4,000 students at the university. And he was, he was chosen to be the, the, <clears throat> the confessor, the chaplain to the court, to the king's court. Long story short, the empress would, was moved by St. John Nepomucene's words. She became very devout. She attended to the poor, to the sick. She was very often visiting our Lord in the Blessed Sacrament. She was always tender and good and kind to her husband, but he was, he was basically what we would call today a slob. He was lazy, foul-mouthed, cruel, because from his youth he was lazy, foul-mouthed, and cruel. And this is how he grew up. And, and he became a king this way. And so he threatened... St. John Nepopomocene, he wanted to know what his wife was confessing in confession. And he said, your, your Highness, you know that's against canon law. That's against the church law. I cannot tell anything from the confessional. He threw in a rage and he had St. John Nepopom put, Nepomocene put in a prison. Later, he had him tortured, stretched on the rack, and burned his sides, and burned parts of his body that are very sensitive and tender. And he did other tortures to him. St. John Nepomuk would miraculously recover from this and go back preaching the faith. One day, he was coming back after saying Mass and preaching, and the king saw him, ordered his guards to bring him to him, and he said to him, you tell me what my wife is confessing, or I'll kill you. He said, kill me then. Like many priests in the history of the world have had to say also, kill me then, because I'm never going to break the seal of confession. So he had his hands and feet tied and thrown off the bridge at night, where few people would witness this. The king thought he could get away with a secret murder, but God would not let, let justice be on slip away. When his body was drowned, his soul went straight to heaven, but his body floated to the top of the river and a huge bright light came off of his body. People noticed this and came and gathered in crowds to see this and when they brought the body in to shore, they saw it was their beloved um, the St. John Nepomuk, the, the, the bishop. By this time he was a bishop. So... He was taken in, and the, it, they found out finally the emperor did this. It was his dirty murder. Yet God worked many miracles, and many people were cured, blind were able to see, and he was buried in an honorable place. And apparently the emperor, Wenceslaus was his name, he died a filthy, slobby, cruel pig. He died the way he lived. And he died unrepentant. And he died without the sacraments. So not a good sign. But certainly St. John Nepomuk would have forgiven him and prayed for his conversion. So here's a martyr of the seal of confession. So let us never lose the, the, power, the sight of the power and beauty of this sacrament of the heart of Jesus. It really is the sacrament of his immense mercy because we're all sick. We're all poor sinners, and many of us have, have uh, the sentence of eternal damnation written on us by mortal sin. Yet in confession, that is completely blotted out and washed away and torn up by the blood of Christ, the soul restored to the state of grace, the friendship of God. And for souls who may not commit mortal sin, it, it cleans off the dust. You get a fresh start again, even though... The just man falls seven times a day. 
says the Holy Ghost, yet he shall rise from them by repentance. So is it good to confess venial sins? Yes, it is. All the catechism says this, all the saints say this. It's good to confess venial sins, but it's not necessary to make the confession complete and valid. What is necessary is to confess all, all mortal sins. But whatever be the case, we must confess some sins in confession. Because sometimes some peasant penitents come and say, Father, I have no sins to confess. Well, then don't come to confession, because there has to be the matter for confession. But then the priest has to say, well, if you want to be absolved, do you have any past sins you want to renew your sorrow for? Oh, yes, Father. Okay, and then they can tell their past sins, then they can receive absolution. Because the matter, like the matter for Mass is the bread and wine, the matter for the sacrament of confession is sins confessed in the seal of confession. So our Lord left this before he rose into heaven, the sacrament of confession. What a beautiful sacrament of God's mercy. What a, a proof of his divine love. Something the Protestants don't have. They don't have confession. So all their guilt of sins weigh on them, drag them down. And you know, nature, there's a saying in philosophy, you push nature up the, the front door, it's going to come in through the back door. So it's part of nature to confess our sins, isn't it? It's, it's part of our nature that we must confess our sins, but for our for personal and shameful sins and horrible sins, God, our Lord, even respects you, all, his, all the faithful. He doesn't oblige you to go on internet or TV and say, these are my sins publicly. He doesn't oblige you to do that. But the Protestants do that because they have no confession. So they get on internet and, and make their confessions to the whole world. And our Lord didn't oblige us to do that. He wants us to confess humbly before him and his, and his ambassador, the Catholic priest, who absolves us in his name. I absolve you from all your sins in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Ghost. Amen. What powerful words the priest can say that frees the soul from the condemnation to eternal fires. So let's love uh, and value this beautiful sacrament of confession. Pray to St. John Nepomuk, this holy priest who died uh, uh, for the seal of confession. Pray for Harrison Butker and uh, also Leopold Chanel, these, these traditional Catholics playing football, that their influence uh, actually might wake up a bishop or two, preferably our traditional ones, but God knows. Bishop Strickland was sowing some great signs. He was resisting the modernism of Rome. He was getting punished. But, you know, he's not a sordo, so he goes to Medjugorje and praises Medjugorje, which is one of those condemned and doubtful apparitions and very dangerous because it's very ecumenical. So even the best of the Navasoro bishops, they're all tainted with Navasoroism and Navasoro apparitions and Navasoro this and Navasoro that. Keep praying for Strickland, but um, but they need Catholic tradition. And the sons of Archbishop Lefebvre have been given the treasure of Catholic tradition. They should be the ones speaking. Their theology is sound if they stay with tradition. So anyway, pray for all the bishops. Pray that they will begin to speak like bishops, preach like bishops. And remember the words of St. Catherine of Siena, woe, woe to this world, woe to the world because of the silence of the bishops, because many go to hell because of their silence. And that's true. Had the bishops spoke out in the 50s, divorce would never have been legalized. Had they spoke out in the, in the late 60s, contraception would never have been legalized or at least not so easy. Had the bishops unanimously raised their voice against abortion, they would never have succeeded to pass it in 1973. But it's the silence of the bishops. And Archbishop Lefebvre said this is what happened in Europe and in Switzerland. <clears throat> because of the silence of the bishops, divorce, abortion, and all these evil laws were passed. So... 
So it's a, it's a you know the people say gold, silence is golden, but no, it's not always golden. It's not always golden. If there's a blind man who's who's feeling his stick, but he get, loses his path, and he's going towards a big a big pit of a construction pit at a construction site, no one is telling them, "Hey, turn around, stop! You're going into a pit. If you fall, you're going to drop fifty feet and die." If no one shouts, those are sins against charity and justice. Imagine crowds walking there, watching this blind man making his way off the, off the sidewalk towards the construction site, towards a, a manhole. And what everyone who was silent would be guilty of murder, or at least grave harm. So that's the state of the bishops today. And the Pope, he's all worried about a good point Michael Matt has been making in the past two or three years. Pope Francis is all about uh, the environment and sustainable economy and, and global warming and all this nonsense. Why? Because they're puppets now of the, of the globalists. That's who they are. It's a, it's a union of church and state under the globalists and under Satan. No longer are they fighting for Christ the King. So that's where we have to stand and fight and proclaim. So pray for the priests to at least blow the trumpet and continue saying what Archbishop Lefebvre was, what he said many years ago still applies more than ever now. Vatican II is a disaster in the church. It's still taking many souls to hell. The new mass is still destroying the faith of millions of Catholics and making them lose the faith. It's all still applicable. The doctrinal declaration signed by Bishop Follet is the document of a traitor. He needs to publicly condemn it, publicly uh, burn it, publicly renounce it, which he has never done. And then, yes, we do expect from Bishop Morgan and Bishop Alini and Bishop Zendeas, these bishops consecrated by Bishop Williamson, yes, we do expect a public statement from them. Why did you leave the SSPX and why are you a bishop now for tradition? Show us where you stand. We have a right to know. Archbishop Lefebvre said that we, the faithful, and the priests too, we have a right to know where the priests and the bishops stand. You have that right to know. Are they modernist? Are they evolutionist? Are they pro-Vatican II? Are they pro-New Mass? We know where Bishop Williamson stands, and he's speaking loud and clear, his errors. Once in a while he comes now out with some good stuff, but most of the time now it's new mass and fake visions, and one in Texas and Valtorta that was condemned in 1949 under the Pius XII, a holy office. So why? Why all this? At least he's speaking and we know where he stands, and that's why we have to resist his errors. But pray for him. And when I speak this way, Obviously, I'm not, I'm not evoking any hard, hateful feelings or any bad sentiments toward them, but rather to pray for them. They're products of the modern world, too. And maybe they're choked up by fears. Maybe they're choked up by, I don't know what's going on. But they're bishops, and they got to do their duty. So maybe we need to pray more for them, and maybe even write them and say, you know, Your Excellency, please... Let us know where you stand. Like Archbishop Lefebvre, he made public declarations, public statements, and the famous 1974 declaration, which still is the trumpet of Catholic tradition. The famous 1974 uh, uh, declaration of Archbishop Lefebvre still applies. That's our declaration of the Catholic resistance. It still applies. We turn a deaf ear to Vatican II in the new Mass. And no peace with modernist Rome until Rome comes back to tradition. That's where we just have to stand. But we can ask these bishops, please state publicly where you stand. And that's not asking much, and it's not making them in a bad light. It's, it's, it's really their duty. Politicians, everyone wants to know where they really stand. Most of them lie, but at least you know where they stand publicly. They have a duty to say this. And this should be all the more with our bishops of the Catholic Church and priests as well. You have a right to know 
Some priests get offended, especially uh, uh, independent priests, when people ask, Father, who ordains you? Are you ordained in the Novus Ordo or are you ordained in tradition? And they get all upset and angry, as if the, the faithful don't have a right to know. But the faithful do have a right to know, because some of these Novus Ordo ordinations are doubtful and possibly invalid. So they should be able to ask the priest, you know, and he should be able to tell them honestly, yeah, I was ordained in the Novus Ordo. Okay, well, not, thank you, Father. I know I'm not going to go to your Mass, because it's doubtful. But that might help encourage these priests to go seek a traditional reordination. Uh, not reordination, but conditional ordination. And that goes with traditional priests who you know are validly ordained, but where do they really stand? On Bishop Williamson's errors, on Bishop Fillet's betrayal, on the, the stand of Archbishop Lefebvre. Do they still take that position or not? You have a right to know these things. That's just the nature of the war. If you're in a war, you want to know whose side are you on. Do we shoot you as an enemy or take you as a friend or a prisoner? You got to know, and we're in the most intense war right now, we got to know what side these bishops are on. So it's not out of place to ask humbly and respectfully, where do you stand? Please let us know. And once we know, then we know where to place ourselves. So let's beg the Mother of God. She is at the, she's the, the one who overthrows all these heresies destroying the church. She is the mother of the Catholic Church. She is our mother. She's going to take care of us, but keep fighting with the weapons she gave us. The rosary, the brown scapular, the five first Saturdays of reparation, spiritual reading, spiritual listening now with audios. You can do that now. Don't get lazy in this war. And that's a big warning to all of our resistance Catholics, and I'm not just talking to you. This is recorded, so it's going to be heard, hopefully, by many souls. But this needs to be said. There's a, there could be a tendency to be lazy about sanctifying our, the Lord's Day, because, well, Father's not here for Mass. He won't be here probably for another three or four months. Or Father Ruiz. And uh, they get lazy on sanctifying the Lord's day. And Sunday goes by and they never sanctified it. You know, that's a mortal sin. Yes, it is. It's a mortal sin. You did not sanctify the Lord's day. But that's a command of Almighty God. And all throughout the resistance, we could get lazy with this. Then we can't let that happen. We must sanctify the Lord's Day. So what do you do when you don't have Mass? Read the Missal. You may follow the live stream. Most do, and that helps. Because you can send your guardian angel, make a spiritual communion, and that helps. Sometimes the Mass starts a little late because I hear confessions, or there's a delay, delay in the flights, or whatever. I know there's some inconveniences. Uh, but nevertheless, that's a good way to do it. Otherwise, read the Missal. Read the propers of the Missal. The propers of that Sunday Mass are the Holy Day of Obligation. And then also pray the Rosary, of course. Some will do the three rows, 15 decades. Some will also read a sermon of St. Alphonsus or, or an encyclical of the Pope or a holy hour of litanies and prayers or stations of the cross. But you must at least spend an hour by divine command of sanctifying the Lord's Day. That's a divine command. And going to Mass is fulfilling the obligation by the church law. So when you do have Mass, and if you don't go, it's a mortal sin, unless you're sick or something. But you have the trident in Mass, and a priest who's not uh, going with uh, compromise and not liberal, you have a duty to drive at least an hour or two or three to get there. You do, I would say. Now, people retort and come back and say, Oh, Father, but the can old Code of Canon Laws says it's only an hour away. If, if Mass is over an hour away, you don't have to go to Mass. You're not obliged. Yes, that's the old code. We're talking horse and buggy. You got to get the horses round up. You got to tie them up, get the girls 
with their, their coats and socks on for the cold ride to, to church an hour away. Then you got mud to worry about, no air conditioning, food, take care of the horse. You don't have those problems anymore. So driving in two hours, three hours, four hours is not asking much anymore with our air conditioned cars and our air conditioned, well, for us priests, airplanes. So we must not become lazy and lax at this stage of the war, but more fervent like the Vendée Catholics, more fervent and zealous like the Cristero Catholics. And that movie, and I'll close with this, I promise, the movie is finally out, Mirando al Cielo, Looking Towards Heaven. The movie is now uh, uh, available at Ignatius Press, and it's in Spanish with English subtitles. But it's a very good film. It's very well done. And I certainly encourage you to see it. The life of blessed Jose del Rio Sanchez, the 14-year-old martyr and a brave boy. So I encourage you all to see that, a great movie. And let's pray that blessed Jose, who shouted all the ways to his death, Viva Cristo Rey. And the Masons told him, shut up, kid. Say death to Christ the King and you can go home to mommy. Viva Cristo Rey! Viva Nuestra Señora de Guadalupe! And they would punch him and kick him and, and uh, push him as, with his bloody feet. He walked a mile to his grave. He kept shouting, Viva Cristo Rey! He was preaching more than our, our own bishops. A little 14-year-old boy preaching and the echo still echoes throughout the world. His shout still echo. So may he intercede for our bishops to preach once again, like our founder did, Archbishop Lefebvre. All they got to do, in fact, is take a sermon of Archbishop Lefebvre and read it. If they're too scared to preach the truth, then just read Archbishop Lefebvre's sermons and it would be applicable. Because in every sermon, he gets on modernist Rome, the New Mass, Vatican II, and all that, to warn souls. Blessed Jose Sanchez, intercede for us, pray for us, and give us a share of your holy persistence. O Mary, conceived without sin. Pray for us, we have O Mary, conceived without sin. Pray for us, we have O Mary, conceived without sin. Pray for us, we have and for those who do not have recourse to thee, especially all communists and Freemasons and other enemies of the Holy Mother Church, amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.